Hi guys, it's Kim, Kim Howerton. I am here live from the comfy sofa. Uh, we are in the middle of putting up all sorts of cheap, different artwork soon. So you can't see it, but in front of me on the other side of the computer, there's a bunch of things we've been framing stacked up. So different artwork coming soon. I know you couldn't see that, but there was something on my screen that was irritating me. Uh, I'm hoping that people are well. It is a Tuesday, the 24th of August at this exact time that I'm recording this. So whether you're watching me live or the recording, hello. And uh, glad to be here with you guys. I just came back from Omaha. Omaha. Uh, I know that's not how you say it. Omaha, um, which is in Nebraska. Uh, and I was there for the Omaha Keto Summit to spend a little time hanging with Dr. Barry and Ms. Nisha and a little Beckett. I was gonna say baby Beckett, but he's kind of a big boy now. So happy to be here with you guys. I'm using something called StreamYard to stream live in from both YouTube and Facebook. So you might be seeing this on Facebook, you might be seeing this on YouTube, either way, hello. It pulls your comments and questions in, so I should be able to see them. If I miss your question or comment, I apologize. Sometimes I miss things, so. Happy to have you here. Uh, hey, Caboodle Bree. I'm glad, I don't know who you are based on your name on the way I'm seeing it, but it was, I'm sure it was also very lovely to meet you. I, I would remember you if I knew what your real name was. <laughs> anyway, uh, Hazel, it's nice to see you from Indonesia. Um, and I am so glad to be here with you guys today. I'm actually headed out tomorrow. Not that thrilled about it. It's nice to be home. I, I shouldn't say that, but you know, sometimes you get home and you're like, oh, it's nice to be home. And it was nice to see my boyfriend and hang out a little bit. But I am hanging out, uh, going on down to San Diego. I'm, I wasn't going to go, but I'm going to go to Low Carb San Diego because I'm going to help my good friend, Dave Feldman. Dave Feldman, my friends. If you don't know who Dave Feldman is, you should. He's a cholesterol master. And I'm going to help him with, he has a project called Own Your Labs, which is at ownyourlabs.com, O-W-N, own, own your labs, as in you own your labs. It's a company where you can get blood tests. You know, like all those blood tests we want to do, my mail program is freaking out. Hello, there we go. Okay. Um, you know, like you want to get your own insulin or see peptide tested, but your doctor won't order the test or you don't have a doctor right now and you want to order your own tests. Well. And go through on your labs. Now you're, you might say, you might say, why should you use own your labs versus like direct test or Ulta? And I would say, Dave would say, always comparison shop. Own your labs might not have the best price, but here's kind of a nice detail about own your labs. They, they ask you, but if you give permission, they'll be able to use data from your tests in studies about low carbohydrate eating. Isn't that exciting? Because what happens? We always end up where people are like, well, we don't have the studies on that. We don't have the studies on that. We don't have the studies on that. Well, he's trying to put together the studies on that, but it's all voluntary, but you get an extra 10% discount off your test if you check the box that says, yeah, you can accuse, uh, accuse. you can include my data in your, in your, uh, in your reports, but um, it's anonymized. So they take your name off, they take your identifying information off, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, if you want to know more information about it, you can go to ownyourlabs.com. There's a little video that's very cute. Um, and so uh, please check out Own Your Labs and look at the different tests that are available. So anyway, I'm going down to San Diego because there is a conference there, Low Carb USA in San Diego, um, that, uh, that you've got... Uh, all sorts of amazing speakers speaking there. And they have you know tables where you can see products and whatever. And so Own Your Lab is gonna have a table. Dave is speaking. So Dave was like, could you help me with the table? So I'll be there at the table with my good friend, Lisa. And we're gonna be there as well. And Tracy says, love the idea of Own Your Labs. Quest is also offering a selection. Yeah, there's Quest, there's a direct test. There's Ulta Labs. There's a t there's a quite a few companies you can order from. Um, I just like supporting the low carb community through Own Your Labs and on some of their tests, especially the cholesterol ones. They're a really good deal because Dave's people are very cholesterol focused. But you can get all the tests through them. 
So uh, something to look at and you can go to own your labs and then there's a place where you can shop and you can search for whatever tests you're looking for and see. There's a bundle we're putting together for the low carb San Diego experience that will have maybe a little extra discount. So if you want information on that, just let me know. Um, Peggy says, yes, use the Feldman protocol. Last class, so I'll check my LD went down, HDL up, 62, triglycerides were 42. Yeah. Yep. Hey, Mel. Yeah. The, the Feldman protocol is very interesting, isn't it? It just, I mean, it mainly shows you how you can manipulate your cholesterol numbers <laughs> by eating differently. Um, uh, Roxanne said, I would have no clue what tests to get. So a bundle might help me. Yeah. There's a bundle called digging deeper bundle. If you're interested in a, in a fairly comprehensive cholesterol panel, that's the one I recommend. And I think we're gonna have that as a special package. So I'll be posting at the Ketonist on this page um, in my Facebook group. And I'll also, you know what I'll do? I'll add a comment to this video everywhere it's posted um, in, the, in the, you know, the description. If we have any discount links or anything like that coming this weekend, I'll put them in there so you guys can know about it. Um, there was a question. Uh, Mel said, um, my blood pressure was high last week. I went to a doctor and she said, cut out salt, even if it's sea salt, because it may be the culprit. My lab came back and turns out my iron is super low. And I don't think that has to do with your iron intake. Also, she said, my cholesterol is high, which is the bad cholesterol I should be watching out for. Okay, so let's let's go to this question. Um, so, hey, Mel, you had a little to unpack in there. So blood pressure and sodium. So first thing I'll say is the primary cause, the, the most abundant cause of primary hypertension, hypertension is high blood pressure, looks to be high insulin. Now, that doesn't mean that high insulin is the only cause of um, high blood pressure. So just saying that. So that's why most people, when they go low carb, they do actually see a drop in blood pressure. Before I went low carb, my blood... I am like a tongue twister today. My blood pressure was always 120 over 80, which is what kind of they say it should be, right? But then I went low carb and my blood pressure start will come in at like 110 over 70 and even lower than that. So you can just see that it, it tends to have a drop in blood pressure, still very healthy. Um, there, for most people who are not on a low carb diet, they do see that lowering sodium can for some people lower blood pressure but the reality is on a high carb diet it's because the kidneys are recycling so much sodium that they get in that loop uh most things i've seen have said that it's actually a, a very small minority of people who are salt sensitive that have higher blood pressure with higher sodium so I'm not saying it doesn't happen because it does happen, but it's the minority of people who are otherwise healthy and have healthy insulin levels and healthy insulin markers. Um, so uh, the fact that your iron is super low is definitely a concern. Um, having a good amount of sodium intake does not cause usually that to be a problem. Um, your cholesterol being high, when you ask about bad cholesterol, Honestly, there is no such thing as good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. It's all contextual. Usually when people are referring to bad cholesterol, what they're talking about is um, LDL, but it's not really bad cholesterol. It's not even really cholesterol. It's, uh, it's anyway, it's a long story. It's a lipid. So um, I would suggest going to, speaking of the devil, Dave Feldman's cholesterolcode.com. Spell the word cholesterol, then C O D E dot com. And there's a lot of good information about there in there about markers. The other thing I would say is you said your blood pressure was high last week. So I just want to say that um, no doctor should base any, any diagnosis or blood pressure information off of one single blood pressure reading, especially in the office. If it's suddenly like very high, then that's something that merits investigation. Um, and so I would say, uh, take your blood pressure at home if you're noticing there's a problem. Um, we often, like I, if I was like running late to my doctor's appointment, once I got in a car accident in the parking lot of my doctor's office and my blood pressure was really high, 
I, I never again went to that doctor because when I went in and she tested my blood pressure, she's like, your blood pressure is high. And I was like, yeah, I just got in a car accident. Um, I'm a little upset. And she was like, here's a pamphlet on high blood pressure. And here's our thing. You should go to this thing. And I was like, I don't have high blood pressure. I've never had high blood pressure. I just got in a car accident and like just wasn't hearing me. I did not see that doctor again. Um, but so you have to think about the whole context. Now it, it's possible you do have high blood pressure, but one random high blood pressure does not high blood pressure me. So always look into that. Um, my hair is very flippy. Dude. I cut it and I really like it, but it's very like flipped up at the end today. I don't know. I'm looking at that. It's not always that way. Um, I just washed it. Uh, Miss Cindy Lou says, hi, Kim, if I fast from 6 p.m. every night until noon the next day and I have a large amount of coffee, large amount of coffee uh, with around one and a half tablespoons of heavy cream around 8 a.m., does that break my fast? OK, let's unpack this one. So a lot of times people are concerned with an over like with something breaking a fast. And for me, one of the things you have to look at in terms of what breaks a fast is to know what you're fasting for, right? So there can be a variety of reasons to fast. Um, increased autophagy is often brought up as a reason someone might be fasting. We've also got things like uh, reduced insulin for long periods of time might be a reason someone fasts. And so you're looking at what would violate the effects you're trying to get from the experience you're having. So me, um, I would say one and a half tablespoons of heavy cream is, I have, it has now been so long since I've used heavy cream. I forgot how, what the macros are on there. Uh, that, that's unusual. I used to totally know. Is it a hundred calories in a tablespoon? Hold on. Chronometer to the rescue. Heavy whipping cream. One tablespoon is 50 calories. Okay, so if we put in 0.75, no, not 0.75, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. 1 okay, so about 75 calories, about eight grams of fat in that. Why did I do that? Why did I just check that? Because it helps to know the macros in your, in your experience. Um, you know, that amount of calories, you know, it depends who you ask, right? If you ask Jason Fung, it's more than 50 calories, don't do it in a fast. That's one look. It's mostly, those calories are mostly coming from fat. So they're not going to have a big impact on your insulin. However, the coffee could if you're coffee sensitive, but not everyone is. So I would potentially look at your, what your blood sugar does in response to that cup of coffee. If you see no blood sugar effect and you see, um, you know, no real change in many things, then sure, it's, it's technically probably sort of mostly like fasting. Um, I guess, you know, for me, I am totally a rebel, you know, and uh, I, I chafe a little bit at like hard and fast rules. I love to know the rules so that I know how to properly break them. Um, but for me, it's, I'm going to have to like come out of the closet on this one. I'm not as into fasting as a lot of people. So while I support it for people that um, it works for and that love it and feel great when they're like going on long fast and engaging in fast, I think sometimes we think we're getting benefits from it that we're not um, potentially. And so if you, if it works for your lifestyle and eating um, between noon and six, it's like a great way for you to manage your hunger and your food intake and you feel great. You know, I don't know that I would have a problem with one and a half tablespoons of cream in my coffee in my fasting window. Um, but you, you do what works for you. Did the, I hope that made sense as an answer. Um, I think we make these things a little too black and white. Um, Donald says, when I go bicycle, bicycling for four miles, my blood sugar goes up. But when I go for an all day bicycle ride, my blood sugar goes down. I don't understand. I tried to ask Dr. Bear. Okay. So um, when I go bicycling, so are you testing your blood sugar at the end of the bike ride or all throughout? Like, do you have a continuous glucose monitor or are you just testing it at the end? Because one of the things that can happen during a shorter bike ride, right, is your, your, you're maybe going at a little bit of a harder pace. And if you test right after that, you might find that because of that exertion, your blood sugar went up, but then it comes down. 
Whereas if you did an all day bike ride, you might be doing it a bit of a more of a leisurely pace. You might not be riding quite as hard. And so generally speaking, I would say I'm not totally surprised by that information. I am not concerned at all about rises in blood sugar from exercise. It's generally a good thing. You can talk about it like something called a hormetic stress, which is like a stress that ends up being a good thing in the long run. And so your body is mobilizing some blood sugar on that short ride because it feels like you've got, um, it need like essentially your body will be like, let's mobilize some blood sugar uh, because it seems like this person needs it right now. So blood sugar is energy. So your, your liver produces more glucose and then gives it to you in your blood so that you can use it for energy. So during that shorter ride, you're experiencing that that rise, but when you're going for a longer, slower bike ride, it might not go as high, or it might have gone high at the beginning, but then you tested at the end and it had time to come down. Not concerned about it in the slightest. Um, sure, if it's going up to like 300, there might be something else going on, but just that it's just a little higher because of your bike ride, not a concern. Good thing, ride your bike. Um, Noreen says, I want a good vitamin brand to take. Do you know what happens when you are low in vitamin D? So when you are low in vitamin D, all sorts of bad things happen. I'll just put it that way. Um, your immune system doesn't work as well. Your metabolism doesn't work as well. You want to have sufficient vitamin D, uh, which looks like more around, I think, as high as 55. I think it's, is it nanograms per deciliter? It's whatever the measure is. I, you know, it's I use, sorry, I use in, in the United States anyway. Um, I've seen that you kind of want to aim for 55 ish or a little higher, um, recently in terms of, uh, optimal immunity. Anyway, a great person to check in with about micronutrients is Chris Masterjohn. He's not super into keto, but he's keto adjacent. Like, you know, he's friendly with some keto people, but he has a lot of great information on vitamins and minerals. Um, so definitely vitamin D is on the short list of uh, supplements that I think are a great idea. The best way to get vitamin D is to spend time in the sun. Um, but I definitely think uh, spending some uh, quality money on a vitamin D supplement is useful. Most of the time with vitamin D, I would say take a vitamin D3 K2 combination. They often come together. You can also take them separately, but they often come together. My favorite vitamin brand in general is Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E. They're not the cheapest, but they are the best. There are some others that are good too, but that's my go-to recommendation. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate the vote of confidence on me looking good today. I barely put on the makeup. <laughs> I was like, they'll be fine if I don't put makeup on. I did fix the eyebrows. Um, Ellie says, tips for getting enough protein in some days. I'm not hungry at all. Yeah, I'm a big protein advocate in case you haven't learned that yet. I wasn't when I first started keto, but I certainly am now. I make sure I get quite a bit of protein today. I think today I'm going to come in around 160 grams of protein. Um, so what, it, what do I do to make sure I get enough protein in? I make sure every time I eat, I'm getting no less than 30 grams of protein in that meal. And when I do that, the protein just tends to work out for the day. Eat three times a day, no less than 30 grams in a meal. I'm never getting under 90, but I'm rarely getting that little. It's usually more like 120. Um, one of the things I do um, is I uh, make protein heavy desserts because I'm, I'm not the kind of girl that turns down a dessert. I'm going to say I love them. So um, a lot of times after dinner, I might have um, my protein cheesecake, which I've posted the recipe before. But basically, I take, uh, let me see if I can remember this, about 15 ounces of cottage cheese. And then I, I drain off any liquid I can. You know, I just kind of turn it sideways and let any liquid drain out. I uh, whiz that in the food processor until it looks like ricotta cheese. Some containers of cottage cheese are like 15, uh, 16 ounces, just throw the whole, you know, drain off the extra liquid and then throw the whole thing in there. Be fine. Uh, about nine ounces of thick Greek yogurt, some sweetener to taste. You, that's for me, that's only like one or two tablespoons. Um, maybe a few drops of stevia glycerite too. Uh, I'm going to zest a lemon, throw that in there. Maybe some of it, squeeze the juice in there too. And then I do two egg whites and two whole eggs. So I process everything then except the eggs, then slowly just, just whiz the eggs in. You don't want to overmix the eggs. The eggs are the last ingredient to go in. If you overmix the eggs, don't worry about it. It just makes your cheesecake sink in the middle. I usually don't mind. Um, and then I put them in a double, like oversized 
cupcake containers. You know, little one, the normal ones are about this size, double, the bigger ones are about double size. Uh, you can use the little ones too. Um, and then I throw those in the oven, 325. It's about a half an hour if you use the double size. It's more like 15 to 20 minutes if you use the normal size. Boom, cheesecake. Uh, and then uh, that's easy peasy. And that's like a good amount of cheesecake. Now, if you're lazier, you can literally cut a cheese and yogurt and throw some fruit in it. I just like the idea of a cheesecake. Um, you can also make that in a big cheesecake, a whole cheesecake, but then obviously you'll need to cook that a little longer. Um, so that's an easy way to get more protein in. Um, the other thing I do is, again, I like my first meal of the day, is cottage cheese and yogurt. That I, I just, it's easy. It's always in the fridge. I have that. For lunch, I might do like an egg life wrap with some meat in it. It's going to get a good solid dose of protein with that. Uh, then for dinner, I'll have like a bunch of flank steaks and some vegetables, maybe a big salad with some flank steak in it. And then one of my cheesecakes. And I'm easy at 120. Um... Tracy says, and, and Ellie, when I went higher protein, I had to sacrifice some fat. I had to, I was like, okay, if I'm going to prioritize getting at least this much protein, I'm not going to be hungry enough for that much protein if my fat stays up where it was. So I had to drop my fat back so that I had enough room in my hunger bank for that much protein. New exchange. Um, Tracy says, does fat, say a shot of olive oil, raise your glucose and cause an insulin response? So there is this discussion about, um, some people will say that, um, you know, fat causes zero insulin response or very little insulin response. And other people will say it causes a delayed insulin response. So you'll see it the next day. I honestly don't know. Um, I, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen that fat causing an insulin response, certainly not a shot of olive oil. Um, that being said, I'm not an insulin scientist and I don't test people's insulin on the regular. So I'm leaving the door open for that one. But according to Ben Bickman, he doesn't really see that so much. Now, it is true that when you carry a lot of body fat and when you overeat as well, so overeating, carrying a lot of body fat, all of that can have an effect on what's going on with your insulin. So I'm not ruling it out, but I'm all, I would also wonder why you're adding a shot of olive oil. What, you know, what would be the point of that? Um, Helene, Helen, not Helene, sorry, Helene, Helen, having trouble today. What do you think of the study that Maria Emmerich had on IG saying alternate day fasting isn't what it's cracked up to be? What causes the last lock of, <laughs> loss of lean body mass? There's a lot of L's in your sentence, Helene. Uh, Helen, uh, unless, okay. So I actually have looked at this study and I haven't looked at the, the study itself. I've looked at what people have talked about in this study. So I'm, I need to actually look at the study to confirm what people are saying. But basically the end result of the study was that they took a group of healthy male, young, weight stable men male men. Um, uh, and so these are not people who have excess body fat. So I want to say that up front that I, and I do think that people with excess body fat versus lean people respond a little differently to fasting. Okay. So I'm just going to say that they took three groups. They split the, they randomized these, these men into three groups. Um, one group they gave, they just said, eat 75% of your maintenance calories. So maintenance calories are generally defined as they track people for a while and see what caloric intake they maintain their weight at, right? If they ate more, they would gain. If they ate less, they would lose. So if they take that maintenance level and then they they made, they gave them 75% of it, okay? So that means that they were in a 25% caloric deficit. The second group, they gave 150% of their maintenance calories every other day. So the first group ate every day, just less than they would normally eat. The second group, they ate every other day and it averaged out to 75% of their caloric intake. Does that make sense? So group A and group B eating the same amount of calories. They're not eating the same amount of calories, but they're eating the same amount of calories relative to their maintenance level. Hopefully that makes sense. So uh, if it was just purely about calories and nothing else. Like it's just, if you get enough calories over averaged over the week, these two groups would look the same. If there was something else going on, they'd look different. Right. So that's what they were looking at. And then the third group, 
ate at their maintenance calories, but with alternate days. So they ate 200% of their maintenance calories every other day. So it averaged out to 100%. So those were the three groups, as if I'm getting this right. And basically at the end of the study, what they found is that the people that ate at 75% of the maintenance rather than the every other day um, uh, looked better metabolically. They lost less lean body mass. From what I can see, they corrected for a lot of things like water weight and fluctuations like that. So ultimately what this study was trying to say was, um, Fasting is not better than a caloric deficit. Um, the thing that I, I think a lot of people would bring up is I don't know who would put a weight uh, a person at a healthy weight on alternate day fasting, right? You'd put someone who's overweight on alternate day fasting, or you'd put someone who's overweight on caloric restriction. So I would have preferred to have seen this study in a group of people that were, I don't know. 30%, 25%, even 10% over the weight that they wanted to be, right? Because, um, or not just wanted to be, but, you know, technically overweight, whatever, however you define that. Um, because lean people, their body responds very differently. So that's, that would be my number one criticism, that they chose to use healthy lean people rather than people who have excess body fat. Um, so what do I think of the study? I guess that's what I think of the study. I'd have to do a little more investigation to, to get drilled deeper into some of the issues. Um, but I'm gonna, you know, I, I, I am like, I try to be sort of in the middle. I try to be moderate on things and say, if fasting works for you, God bless you, keep on fasting. I don't really fast and I don't really, I don't not recommend fasting, but it's not part of my training protocols because it's just not my thing. Um, I do have concerns uh, about people losing lean body mass uh, during fasting. I absolutely do. I do think there can be things that we can do to mitigate that. But when I look out in the world at people fasting, I often see them not doing the kinds of things they might need to do to mitigate the loss of um, muscle mass. And so I'm very concerned. I would rather see somebody lose weight slower, but have that be 100% fat loss then lose weight faster and have a good portion of that be muscle loss because long-term um, a slightly bigger person with more muscle is healthier than a smaller person with less muscle. So that being said, I do believe you can do fasting in a healthy way and you can do things like weight training during your fasts to mitigate some of the muscle mass loss. And so I'm not against it, but I'm also not a huge fasting advocate. Hopefully that made sense. Uh, let's see, looking, sorry, I'm looking for the questions. Um, my PCP, says Lisa, uh, says I will have a stroke if I take my cholesterol meds every day. Is that true? I have had a small stroke in the past and didn't notice. Okay, that is not something I can answer because I am not a doctor and this is the internet. And, and so I don't know if you're gonna have a stroke if you don't take your blood pressure, I mean, sorry, if you don't take your cholesterol meds, I don't honestly know. I think you can uh, look at some of the data out there about the protection of uh, stroke issues from taking various cholesterol medication and make an educated decision. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be able to answer that for you. That would be something that you um, need to talk about with your doctor. And if you start to feel like your doctor doesn't represent the position, you know, if you don't feel like they're really hearing you and you don't think they're up on the things you want them to be up on, look for a doctor that is. Um, Sally Jo likes my hair. Thank you. It does look much thicker, I think, at this length. So I appreciate that. I, You know, when you get a haircut, you freak out for a day or two. You're like, it's shorter than I meant it to be. But you only, you only have so much to go. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, Noreen, I want to do, I want to know what, okay. I, I gave, I answered that question. So somebody else also gave a response about another brand of vitamins. I don't know that brand, but if they say it's good, there you go. Donald says his blood sugar goes up to 250. But Donald, I think you're dealing with long-term blood sugar issues that you might need to, to work on. And I would like to see what, what happens over time with that. Um, Sorry, 
my nose is itchy. Uh, I get such bad allergies, like ugh, such bad allergies. Um, Tracy says the shot of olive oil is only when my window is longer and feel my mood is changing. So, so you, you use a little bit more fat ingestion to, um, to, to, to boost your mood. And you know, that's, that's, valid. Some of us, when I first started keto, keeping my fats above a certain level seemed to really help my mood and help me function better. So I'm not, I'm not against it. And I certainly think a shot of olive oil is not the kind of fat ingestion. A lot of people are talking about when they talk about having higher, uh, glucose and, uh, insulin resistance the next day. All right. Uh, Masinda asked, do I eat a lot of vegetables? I do eat a lot of vegetables. Now, if you'd asked me that question four years ago, I would have said, oh, <laughs> sorry, you guys are on a rolly chair. <laughs> um, uh, uh, if you'd asked me that question four years ago, my answer would have been no, because at the time I didn't. So I've gone through periods of carnivore. I've gone through periods of eating always under 20 grams of total carbs. So I've gone through all sorts of, of different time periods. Right now I eat what I would call maybe more of a low carb diet than a fully ketogenic diet. Um, I eat up to 50 grams of total carbs a day. I focus on high protein. I keep the fats sufficient. I certainly don't eat a low fat diet. Uh, and so you, you have to do what works for you. Um, so, oh, to, but to go back, to go back to the fasting question, Helen said, fasting works for me right now, but I'm overweight and not a male. Absolutely. So one thing that I would say to be aware of is if I were somebody that was going to be doing a lot of fasting as an, a female, especially um, a, an aging one, most especially, um, that would be any, like if you're over 40, I don't mean you have to be old. old. I don't think anyone would call themselves old, hopefully, but you know, I don't think you have to be like, I don't know. I can't give a number because I've just said old, um, older than 40, like 40 is aging, aging, even 35. Um, and I would say, um, you really have to start to look out for loss of lean body mass. And so if I were going to be utilizing fasting in my life, I would definitely be getting regular DEXA scans. That's D E X A or just sometimes D X A. It's like a X-ray of your muscle mass to make sure you're maintaining your muscle mass as you lose body fat. So I would definitely be looking at uh, metrics that measure body fat versus lean body mass to make sure I'm maintaining my muscle mass as I age, because there's really nothing worse for our longevity than losing muscle mass. Um, don't only think about your scale weight. Gosh, I have this discussion with my mom all the time, people, just, just to pull back the curtain a little bit. Uh, you know, whenever we talk about fat loss together, I'm like, always make sure it's fat loss, not weight. She's, you know, when, she, when somebody talks about, I want to get to this number on the scale, if that means that you lost 50% fat and 50% muscle, you're worse off losing the weight than if you didn't lose the weight. I know that's a bold statement, but that's what I'm going to say. Um, because that's ha losing that much muscle mass. It's very hard to regain muscle mass, um, especially as we age. It's a lot of work. So we want to protect what we have. Now, that's not saying don't lose weight at all. Lose the fat, but make sure when you're losing weight, you're losing fat, not muscle. And so I think that's why Maria and many other people that looked at that study were concerned. Um, do I think that's the end all be all study? No, but it gave an indication of why if I were doing regular fasting, I would be getting in a DEXA machine once a month, at least once every three months. If there's not a DEXA machine available, I would be doing other kinds of tests to make sure I'm maintaining my lean body mass as much as possible. Because that is something longevity wise that you don't want to sacrifice. Kathy asked, do I eat 1% fa yay I'll, uh, or 5%? I eat 2%. I don't think they make a 1%. I think they make a 0% and a 2% and a 5%. If they make 1%, I'm just not familiar with it. Maybe they do. I eat 2% though. Uh, I would eat the 5%, uh, but I like the 2% just as much. I, I've taste tested them side by side, but I don't like the 0%. I don't think it tastes as good as the 2%. So I go with the 2%. Uh, 
I use the 2% in all sorts of things. I use the 2% really anywhere you might use sour cream. Um, I, I use it a lot. I love it in my mix with cottage cheese. My favorite cottage cheese brand is Good Culture. Uh, I find it delicious. I don't like all cottage cheese brands. In fact, many cottage cheese brands I do not like at all. Uh, but Good Culture is delicious, for, in my opinion. Um, Ellie says, I'm 44. Is it difficult to build new muscle mass? Yes, it's always difficult. Maybe if, unless you're a 20-year-old boy. Um, <laughs> so lifting weights is the way to do it. Ellie, if you want to gain muscle mass, lift weights. Absolutely something that people will do to gain muscle mass and something I absolutely recommend uh, uh, to maintain and gain muscle mass. Um, but it's not easy, uh, but it's worth it. Even a little bit of gain in muscle mass is worth it. Uh, Susie says, Good info. Thanks for clarifying. Finally took my measurements as slow to lose, but close fit better. That's what you want. Tracy said the scale only shows your body's relationship with gravity. True story. Um, apparently a lot of people like good culture. It is so tasty. So tasty. Um, Sheila says 57, 6, 50. Okay. You are 57. I will translate. <laughs> um, 16 hour fast, two meals a day. Yeah, totally. So two me time restricted eating, which is to say you're eating part of the day and you're not eating the other part of the day, I think is perfectly healthy for pretty much everyone. Um, uh, when, when I'm talking about fasting, I'm really talking about 24 hours or more. Um, that being said, you know, what was interesting at Omaha, Cynthia Turlow, I think her name is, um, talked about maybe if you don't sleep well, if you don't sleep through the night, or you have some hormonal issue that maybe a, sh a very short fasting window is better, like maybe 12 or 13 hours instead of 16 hours. So there can be times when we might change things up. But generally speaking, when I'm feeling concerned about loss of lean body, loss of lean muscle, wow, loss of lean body mass or muscle mass, I'm more concerned with 24 hours or more, generally. But it was interesting to hear the information from Cynthia, who is a fasting advocate. She does she does agree with fasting in general, but talking about when she takes her client off of fasting. Um, and that was in times of extreme stress and when they're uh, not sleeping well at night, that maybe, uh, uh, maybe only 12 to 13 hours being their fasting window and reintroducing breakfast as a meal um, can be beneficial for some people. So it was an interesting perspective. You know, just one of the things that somebody brought up to me after uh, the conference was, wow, a lot of great speakers, but they don't all agree with each other. And that's that's the truth, Ruth. Uh, we don't all agree with each other. Uh, it's it's you know, this person says this thing that contracts this thing that this other person says. And what do I make of that? So you have to kind of navigate what what do you think? Why do you think it? Do you think it because someone told it to you a while ago and it just stuck in your head? Or do you think it because it makes sense? Or so you kind of have to really unpack, you know, what do you agree with, why and how? And it can get hard. It can get confusing. But, you know, the good news is the life is fairly long, you know, maybe not as long as we'd like or maybe a little longer. And you get time to experiment. You can be like, well, this Cynthia woman, who's very pretty, by the way, um, said, Maybe if I'm not sleeping through the night, I shouldn't do so much fasting. Hmm. You know what? I'm not sleeping great. So maybe for the next 30 days, I'm going to try changing up the way that I fast. And I can see what's going to happen. And did I get a better result? And what happened? Do I need to go more in that direction? Or do I need to go in a totally different direction? Right? We get to experiment. We get to see what we think. Um, and we get to put our money where our mouth is. Right? We get to try things out in our own life. And, you know, for me, like, and also acknowledge our biases, right? I am not naturally somebody who loves fasting. Like when I first got into keto, I didn't love fasting. And so I have to be aware that when I'm evaluating fasting studies, I have a bias to err on or to, to side with the anti-fasting people, right? So I have to be aware of that bias in me, that doesn't mean that bias is wrong, but it means it pre-directs me to lean a certain way, right? It's just like if we have a political affiliation, 
which I'm not going to go into right now. But if you have a political affiliation and somebody gets out up on a podium with the same political affiliation as us, we have a tendency to think they're probably right, more correct than the other person from the other affiliation without ever even actually looking into anything any of them are saying. Right? We just have biases. It's normal. It's human. Okay. Um, Janetta. Hey, good to see you, Janetta. Uh, I think the hard part is that they are all correct and you have to find what works for you. Totally, totally, totally. Jackie said, is there a place to watch the conference speakers? I believe they're going to release the talk. I think you can buy it. Um, but I know that uh, Nurse Cindy at Ask Nurse Cindy on Facebook, that's Ask, A-S-K, not A-S-S, -S, um, uh, recorded with permission, recorded some of the talks from the audience. I know she recorded Dr. Barry's. So you can catch up on her Facebook page and see if some of the speakers are there to hear their talks. But what I often do is I'll go, so if you go to the web page from Omaha, which is low carb, I think, no, Keto Omaha, Keto Summit Omaha.com, I think. Google Keto Summit Omaha and it should come up. And then look at the schedule, write down the speakers and then go to YouTube and put those speakers' names into YouTube. Well, tip, a lot of speakers will very reasonably give the same talk at different conferences. So you might be able to see either a similar version of their talk or something else they said that's interesting. So it's a great way to get a little more information about people um, after they've talked at a conference to go and look at YouTube. Okay, so, um, all right, Eva, Eve says, no two journeys are the same. You have to see what works for you. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, YouTube is, is full of information. Lots of good information. So I appreciate a good YouTube session was even, you know, and for me, it's like when I'm doing, when I'm cooking or when I'm doing laundry or just working on something mindless, sometimes I'll just put on YouTube videos and let them play so that I get, get, you know, some new information. And then, you know, most of it, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, what did they just say? Like, I have to go back and listen to that part again, because every once in a while they say something that I didn't know or didn't or had forgotten and I'm like oh yeah I should so it's great to kind of just keep your brain in action around these kinds of topics it's also great to listen to people you don't agree with sometimes to think well what are they saying that I don't agree with what are the actual details of that anyway um, what else is going on? So yeah, so I'm going to, I'm actually decided to drive down to San Diego. I may regret it. I love driving to LA, but San Diego is like another two and a half hours. And you know, that last two and a half hours of a road trip that can be just painful. But I have to say, I, I, I'm, I would, I flew obviously to Omaha <laughs> and you cannot fly direct from California to Omaha apparently. So I had to, you know, change planes and uh, and I was like, by the end of it, I was like, I am not getting on another plane anytime soon. This was awful. I just felt like squished and bleh. I don't like it. And so, um, uh, yeah, I'm old now, apparently, because I'm like, I need an upgraded seat. I cannot fly Southwest anymore. It is painful. Um, and then I realized, well, flying to San Diego from where I live is like, an 80 minute flight. It's really probably not going to be that bad, but whatever. I decided to drive. You know what I was thinking I would do is when I got to San Diego, I would stop at like a grocery store and do a video on how do I deal with food when I travel. So I thought that would be a good opportunity. Why not? Um, Angela says, I live in San Diego, maybe a meetup. Yeah. A lot of people are in San Diego. Uh, well, I assume. Uh, and, and that would be awesome. If you want to organize something, I'll be at the Bayside at the conference and hopefully we can happen. What's happening in San Diego? Lenore, um, low carb USA it has a conference this weekend. Um, and it's, uh, low carb USA. And if you go to low carb USA.com, you can see the conference that's happening. And, uh, so that's happening this weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, 
Deb says, I really enjoy the Maple Hill milk, sugar-free, 80 calories, zero carbs. Yep. So uh, Maple Hill uh, is a, I've talked about this on a previous live, but Maple Hill is a dairy that has come out with a, um, a milk. It's milk. It's filtered milk. Literally, it's just filtered. They haven't done anything nefarious to it. They've filtered out the carbohydrates. So it's lacto it doesn't have any lactose. They've taken out the milk sugars. One of the interesting things that you don't realize is how sweet milk, regular milk is very sweet. And this Maple Hill milk, not very sweet because they filtered out all the sugar. But it otherwise tastes like milk because it is. Um, and so it's available at Whole Foods. But if you go to zerosugarmilk.com, you should be able to find information on it. They make a low fat and a, a full fat version and it is very, very tasty. It makes a mean latte, say that. If you miss milk, it is a keto milk, which is strange, but true. Um, Amy says, to maintain or gain muscle mass, how many days should you weight train? I train two days a week, upper body and lower body. Do you think that's enough? So um, not an expert on, sorry guys, the light is being weird in here. There's like, you know, when the, the curtains have like a little opening, um, I am not a weight training expert. Generally speaking, as far as I know, two days a week is a great amount to train, to maintain. Um, that being said, it has a lot to do with how much you're stressing your muscles. It's Cause it sounds like you're doing one bar, one body part a, a week, right? If you're doing upper body once, I don't, well, I guess I don't know. Do you do upper body and lower body both times? That would probably be what I would recommend rather than, I just not quite, I need clarification to understand, but I would train, if I were only training two times a week, which is pretty much what I do, I train both upper and lower body those days. I focus on large compound movements and that certainly maintains at the very least. Um, so yeah, but some of it depends on how much, how for how long, and are oh I see both okay. Um, she does upper and body both two days. Um, you know how are how for, how much how how much how far are you going? You know, are you going fifty percent, seventy five percent, eighty percent? How many reps in reserve do you have? All of that plays in. Like, are you going towards fail? Like, from what I, you know, you don't really have to go to failure, but you need to get a certain distance close to failure. Uh, to get the maximum benefit, but uh, you don't need to go as hard to maintain as you do to grow for sure. And that's about as far as my knowledge of this situation goes. Um, there are a lot of people that know a lot more about weightlifting than I do. I have to listen to them to know what I'm supposed to be doing. But Robert Sykes is a great one. Robert Sykes, Keto Savage, he is he is a weightlifter. Um, and his wife, Crystal Savage is awesome. And they both have information available online at livesavage.com. Um, okay. Barbara says, I believe I am under eating sometimes less than 1200 calories. How do I eat more? I can't see eggs anymore. Well, I will actually say that eggs are a very satiating food. So sometimes if I want to eat more, I stay away from eggs. Or if I'm doing eggs, I do some eggs and then I mix it. Like I can't eat more than six eggs. If I'm trying to eat six eggs in a sitting, I'm going to really struggle with that. But I could eat three eggs and a lot of bacon. Um, and so you have to kind of choose your, um, one of the meals in a meal plan I used to do was egg salad. And I started calling it the egg salad challenge because everyone was like, I can't finish the egg salad. Um, so there you go. So, you know, I do think there's, I, I think we have a bit of an epidemic of under eating for sure. I think periods of time at 1200 calories, not the end of the world, not a big problem. But if you're eating 1200 calories for a very long time, you know, and, and that 12, when you're eating that little, you should be seeing weight loss. But a lot, I find a lot of people eating that little for long periods of time, their body just totally gets used to it, has downrated their, lated their metabolism. Their body's like, well, if this is all you're going to feed us, then we'll show you what we'll do with that. We won't lose any weight um, because your body's trying to keep you alive. So if you're like, not enough is coming in, less is going out. So I think periodizing your nutrition is very important. So spending time eating more and then spending time eating less. If you're trying to lose body fat, if you're not trying to lose body fat, don't do the less part. But so I, in certain seasons, ramp up as high as for me, this is going to vary from person to person, 1800, 1900 calories and don't gain weight, but I don't lose weight. And then I go down 
to more like 13, 1400 calories for a while, lose some weight, go back up, go back down, go back up, go back down. I periodize things. And so that's how I focus my journey now. And that's how I've gotten to close to 100 pounds lost on keto. I was stalled out around 60 for a long time and started gaining weight again. So this periodization is what I recommend. I really, really recommend spending. So if you've spent a lot of time at a very low amount of calories, I would do a reverse diet. So what is a reverse diet? Reverse diet to me just means I'm going to find my caloric ceiling. The point at which when I hit it, I hit my head on it, I get to the top, I'm like, ow, ow, ow. Scoot down a little bit. You don't want to hit your head on it, but you want to know where the ceiling is, right? Or the doorway or whatever. So um, what I do is I just look at, okay, how much have I been eating? I'm gonna look at the macros, get a good accounting, and I'm just going to go up by about 50 to 100 calories from protein and fat, not from carbs. Um, go up. How'd that go? Go up a little more. How'd that go? Go up a little more. How'd that go? Being aware that as I eat more, a little more water weight's going to hang around. I might gain a few pounds, but I don't want to gain a lot of pounds, right? I want to keep my weight relatively stable. Just keep going up a little bit. When I find that ceiling, I just hang out there for a couple months. That's it. Maintenance. Then I'm going to come. And then at the end, then when I feel ready, when I've been there a long enough time, I'm going to drop it again and try to lose a little more body fat. And I'm going to keep that. So it's just this pattern, repeated pattern where I don't spend more than about 12 weeks in a caloric deficit. And then I go through this periodization. Life is much better, people. I'm much healthier. I'm much happier. I feel more in agency, in charge of my life. I'm not chronically under eating. I have a lot more hair. I mean, yeah, it looks fuller since I cut it, but I was balding. I mean, I've been balding for years, but like it's, it's reversed. I'm feeling better, looking better, sleeping better. So I definitely recommend the periodization approach. Um, and my next, I teach that in my course, Keto Unstuck. My next Keto Unstuck is going to be opening soon. So I'll let you guys know, but it'll be open in the next few weeks. Um, so somebody asked, who asked? Tammy asked. So Tammy, uh, it will be opening soon. I'm actually thinking, I don't know what you guys think. My course is normally 12 weeks. I'm thinking because of this time of the year and we're heading into the holidays of offering it for eight weeks instead of 12 weeks at a slightly reduced price, but you'd still get all the information. It's just not as long. What do you think? Do you, would you prefer it to be eight weeks or 12 weeks? Questions I have. All right. Um, so let me know in the comments what you'd prefer. Obviously the price would be a little lower at eight weeks, but you get, you know, you get all the information, but I'm not holding your hand for as long unless you then join my membership, which you can do. So it's just an idea because I find once we start getting into the holidays, people don't necessarily want to be in an organized course at that point. Um, so uh, I was like, well, maybe I'll do a special short version for it. Oh, two people have voted for eight weeks thus far. So maybe I'll do that. Um, oh, three people, three votes for eight. Oh, four votes for eight weeks. All right. Well, eight weeks, maybe it is. Um, all right, guys, so I'll post information about that in the next few days and uh, and we'll go with that. So I'm thinking maybe like we do mid-September through mid-November and then that'll be just in time before the holidays. So that'll be good. Um, hey, Auckland, New Zealand. Nice to have you here. Um, okay, people are in on the eight weeks. Good to know. See, I learn. Um, do we need to sign up the wait list? Or are you on the way? You're on. Hey, nurse Cindy, my love. How are you doing? It was so good to hang out with you in Omaha. Um, you don't need to sign up on the wait list if you're already on there. You should get emails even if you were on the wait list before. Once you're on there, you're on there. Marilyn says if you're trying out the reverse diet for a while, an eight-week program won't get you through the reverse period, will it? No, it won't. It will give you all the information, but like I said, I won't be there to hold your hand through their whole reverse, but I do have a monthly membership. So at the end of the eight weeks, they can join the monthly membership if they feel like they still want me with them. So there's an option. So I'll percolate on that a little bit. Um, Linda, Linda, did you get my emails a couple weeks ago when I said, hey, we're opening up? You'll get, if you didn't sign up for that program, you'll still, you'll get the emails the next time. Um, Aisa said, when will the Zoom be available? 
right after this call, I will check why it's not available already. <laughs> it will be available right afterwards. I'll see what happened. Sometimes technology lets me down, Aisa. So I'll, I'll double check what happened there. You didn't, Linda. Okay, well, they may have gone to your, oh, sorry, I keep moving the chair. They may have been, gotten to your, um, what do you call it? Junk mail, but go ahead and sign up again for the wait list at KU, the letter K, the letter U, dot kimhowerton.com. Sign up again and if something, maybe something uh, didn't happen. I get it. There are reasons we might sign up for something or not. Linda, don't worry about it at all. But yeah, sign up again in case you're concerned that maybe you didn't get on the wait list like you thought you did. But um, if you're if you know you're on there and you got emails saying that you are on the wait list, then um, then you should be on the wait list. Um, all right, guys. Well, this might be a good stopping place for the day. I hope that everyone has a fabulous week. I'll be coming to you live. I'll try to do a live while I'm down in San Diego to kind of just give you some info about what's going on. Um, when I have more information about Own Your Labs details, I will post it in the in the description for this video. And so if you want links, you can have them. But if you want to go shopping now, ownyourlabs.com, and you can search for any tests you've been thinking about getting. Dr. Barry and I, you, you did, Nurse Cindy, we're like at the end. Um, uh, nurse Cindy is one of my favorites. So uh, nurse Cindy, I did send them to your page if they wanted to see some bootlegs of Omaha presentations that you, I told them you got a, approval to, to post them. So, um, that those are there. Um, all right. Um, Barbara says I got element. You can ask a question, nurse Cindy, if you have one, we got about three or four minutes left. Um, uh, I got Element Electrolyte Sample Pack that I suggested that they break your fast. I don't think that they break the fast, no. Um, if, but they, but I would, if you're somebody that's sensitive to sweet flavors, that they make you hungrier, um, the, the flavored ones have flavor. Um, and so um, if, if sweet flavors make you hungrier, then I would stick with the unflavored ones rather than the flavored ones. But I don't have a problem with a little bit of stevia in your fasting window, to be perfectly honest. Um, Nurse Cindy, own your labs, ownyourlabs.com. Um, own Your Labs is a company run by our friend Dave Feldman, where you can purchase your own lab work. Now, there are a few states that you can't get it in. I think New York, New Jersey, Hawaii, and then I think Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. I don't know. There's like four, maybe five. Um, but most states you can order your own labs. Deborah, uh, the speakers were, Nurse Cindy can help me out. Cynthia Turlo, Lowell, what's, what's her first name? Eh, she's from Minnesota and my brain just went blank. She has like my birthday too. I'll have to, I'll, you know what? If you go to, Keto, Kristen, Kristen Lowell, there we go. Kristen Lowell, uh, Cynthia Turlo, Maria Emmerich, Dr. Barry, Dr. Sivas, Jamie Seaman, there was a lovely Navy SEAL guy. Um, I think that's everybody. Is that everybody? Yeah, Dr. Barry, Dr. Sivas. I think that's, I think that's, yeah, that's what I can remember. A great, great talks. But if you go to Keto Summit Omaha and look at the schedule, you'll get a list of everyone that was there. And yeah, my general advice is if you're interested in these people and they, their talks sound interesting, take their name and plug it in at YouTube and you can see some previous talks that they've done and you can get a feeling for them. So that is my best advice on that. Um, the one thing that Tom Shea, there you go, Navy SEAL that spoke. Um, uh, Gabrielle Lyon was on the schedule, but she's sick. And so um, Kristen Lowell filled in for her and she was fabulous. So that's one difference of from what was posted. Gabrielle Lyon wasn't there, but Kristen Lowell spoke in her place, which was very good. It was a short conference because, it, yeah, it was only one day and an evening. And so um, that means there weren't a ton of speakers. Um, Chris asked, being in moderate ketosis safe for a type two diabetic? Yep, yep, certainly. Um, 
if you're talking about a, a concern about ketoacidosis, ketoacidosis requires very high ketones um, as well as high blood sugar. So that's the concern um, and generally not, not an issue uh, with, uh, with uh, eating a well-formulated ketogenic diet. Also, when you say moderate ketosis, I'm guessing you mean from the urine strips. And I wanna say you can never really trust the level of color, moderate to dark to light on the urine strips, it's kind of like, yeah, I'm in ketosis. No, I'm not in ketosis because what color it turns depends very much on how hydrated you are. Um, Tom, the seal was awesome. Yep, Nurse Cindy, totally. And Tom did have an interesting point. Um, one of the things he brought up that's really stuck with me is a lot of people say, know your why, know your why, know why you're doing something. You know, when, the, when people say, well, you know, about motivation, you know, know your why. And I think that's very, I agree that that's very important. But what he said, what's more important is knowing who you are, knowing who you are, right? Uh, why are you doing it? I'm doing it because I said I would, and I'm a person that keeps their word. I thought that was very powerful. Um, Rita says, they're going to be a place to watch the conference in Omaha. I believe they said that the talks are going to be available for sale and then maybe eventually for free. Um, but I don't know when, where, how. So I would check in at Keto Summit Omaha and there'll probably be an update at some point about the availability when, where, and how. Usually what I see with conferences, a very po a common um, thing is they'll make them for, for a fee for some period of time. And then like a year later, six months later, at some point in the future, they make them free. That's what I usually see that you want to pay. They, they charge for immediacy. Uh, Dr. Uh, Asner Cindy says, yes, know who you are and embrace the suck. Yeah. He's a Navy SEAL very much into embrace the suck. It's going to suck. It sucks right now. Embrace that. Embrace how hard it is. Uh, it's a growth experience. All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Nurse Cindy, I hope we get to hang out very soon. I'm, I'm going to, I, I miss you. Oh, Nurse Cindy rolling. Oh yeah. If you go to Nurse Cindy's page, I believe she rolled down a hill. Um, with some other ladies. So check out the shenanigans and um, I will be back next week with you. But like I said, I'll do a live while I'm in San Diego if I can. Hugs to you guys. Hugs to Nurse Cindy. Bye guys.